The word myth comes from the Greek mythos and referred to a traditional story. Over time, however, the term acquired a second meaning, that of a popular but erroneous idea or belief. Taking this definition, we realize that myths have existed, perhaps since long ago, and some may still persist. Myths of marine monsters that entrap ships, of strange creatures that walk like men. And we have contemporary myths, such as those that appear in movies. Could it be that myths also exist in research? Certain ideas that we might think are true, but that, though popular, are ultimately wrong. Erroneous beliefs, like weeds, flourish with little cultivation. And while myths certainly abound amongst those who are recently initiated in the realm of research, it is possible that fallacies may still linger in the subconscious mind in an almost imperceptive format. In this presentation, we will consider a number of these research myths, with some having been identified years ago, but still present today. We will seek to be proactive, not only in countering myth with evidence of its fallacy, but endeavoring to trace a clear delineation of realities that must ultimately replace misconceptions. The first myth, research answers every question. What is research? If we take a formal definition, research is a systematic inquiry based on gathering and analyzing information designed to develop and contribute to generalizable knowledge. Systematic inquiry means that we are asking questions and seeking answers to unknowns, all in an organized and purposeful manner. Generalizable knowledge points to the fact that we are looking for answers that extend beyond the immediate. We can, however, ask different types of questions, such as the following. What is the symbol for iron? How well has been mastered the objectives of this course? How can we convey the strategic priorities of our organization? Should physician-assisted suicide be legalized? We answer the first question through learning, the second through an evaluation process, the third by developing something, in this case, a strategy or process, the fourth through an ethical or policy analysis. The key point is that research is only one approach to find answers to problems that we encounter. Only one method among several, but certainly an important method. At the same time, we must recognize that research, while not omnipotent, can assist us in considering many non-research questions. For example, on the topic of physician-assisted suicide, Research can help us better understand the following aspects. What are the attitudes and beliefs of patients and healthcare providers regarding assisted suicide? What factors contribute to request for an assisted suicide? What is the experience of families whose loved ones participate in physician-assisted suicide? We can conclude that although research is not an appropriate method to answer every important question, it can still
clarify the context of the various questions that we define as important. A second myth. Data can speak for themselves. Consider that we encounter four points as they appear here on the screen. What do they represent? Well, obviously, the corners of a square. Or do they define a circle? Or perhaps something in between? Or do they stand for an X or an arrow? What do these four points truly represent? Our conclusion is based on our interpretation of the data. In other words, the data do not speak for themselves. They must be always interpreted. And that interpretation is influenced by our worldview, our way of seeing and making sense of that which surrounds us. Two people, therefore, can look at the same data, the same information in a study, and see different patterns because they view them from two different perspectives. This does not necessarily mean that one of those interpretations is necessarily more valid than the other, although in some cases arguments could be assessed as more robust within the context of a given discipline. Third myth, a larger sample is better. It is often heard that the greater the number of participants in the sample, the better the study will be. To some extent, that position makes sense. Many shortcomings in research stem from the lack of an adequate sample size, which does not allow us to draw valid conclusions. And we will further comment on that point in a subsequent myth. We must recognize, however, that as we continue to increase sample size, we arrive at a point of diminishing returns, in which what we receive from the process is less than what we invest in it. In essence, we lose efficiency without increasing effectiveness. Perhaps we can illustrate the problem. Imagine that we are sitting in a boat on a small lake. The greatest depth of the lake is 10 meters, and the visibility from the surface is 5 meters. From the boat, we can look down and perceive certain features of the bottom of that lake, contours that are evident between the surface and five meters deep. But we cannot perceive what the topography of the lake is like beyond that depth. We have only one tool at our disposal to continue that exploration. We can turn on a pump that can draw water from the lake. And in doing so, the water level begins to drop. Sitting in the boat on the surface and always with a visibility of five meters, we now begin to distinguish new characteristics of the bottom of the lake, aspects that we did not see before. We continue to pump water from the lake until the surface is five meters above the deepest point. We can now distinguish all the important features of the topography of the bottom of that lake. We have made important discoveries. We now know what we did not know before. But imagine that we continue the project of pumping out the water. Although we could further extract 
a good amount of water out of the lake. What we see regarding its topography no longer presents us with important new information. The water pumped from the lake represents the sample. With a very small sample, we discover almost nothing beyond that which we already knew intuitively. Our findings are nothing more than those obvious things that we knew before starting the research. Matters which were already visible from the surface. But as sample size increases, we move beyond the obvious and begin to discover things of importance. Findings that were not detected from our position on the original surface of the lake. There comes a point, however, where what is truly important has already been identified and the small details that are now revealed are not of great consequence. We have moved from the important to the trivial. And when that happens, we have lost a positive yield. In a research study, which should be parsimonious, we have lost efficiency. Furthermore, we must recognize that sample size is only one part of the equation. Representativeness is equally important. If we increase the size of a non-representative sample, part of another myth that we shall explore, our results will never become more accurate. But assuming for the moment that the sample is representative, what then should be its ideal size? That question leads us to the next myth. Myth number four. Minimum acceptable sample size is a magic number. Sometimes, in an endeavor to facilitate the process, some individuals indicate that the sample should be a certain proportion of the population, for example, 10%. Let us put aside for the moment the problem that we often do not know the size of the population. If the population is 10 people, interviewing one person, that is 10%, would obviously be too few to draw reliable conclusions. And if the population is 10,000 people, interviewing 1,000 people, again 10%, would be needlessly high. We will have spent much time and effort without significantly increasing the trustworthiness of important results. In a desire to speed up the process, others take the position that the minimum sample size is a certain fixed number of participants, such as 100 persons. If the population is 50 people, however, trying to get a sample of 100 will be impossible. And if the population is 10,000 people, a sample of 100 will be statistically significant only for findings of what was already obvious without conducting the study. What then should we do to determine the minimum required sample size? In short, we conduct a power analysis. In any study, there are four interrelated factors linked in such a way that when any three of them are defined, the fourth is determined as a result. These four factors are alpha, beta, gamma, and n. Consequently, to determine in the minimum sample size, we need to set alpha, beta, and gamma. The factors alpha and beta have to do with the probability of making a mistake, of stating a conclusion incorrectly. 
and gamma has to do with what the researcher considers to be important as opposed to trivial. Let us first consider the decision errors, whose limiting probabilities are represented by alpha and beta. To do so, let us use an analogy. The decision to carry or not to carry an umbrella when heading out for the day. If I decide to bring an umbrella and then it rains, I have made the right decision. But if I decide to carry an umbrella and then it does not rain, I have made a decision error, a type 1 error whose probability is related to alpha. Alternatively, I can decide not to carry an umbrella. If it does not rain, I am fine. But if it rains, I have again made a decision error, a type 2 error whose probability is related to beta. Let us change the metaphor. If I am a physician and a patient arrives having a certain pathology, I must make a decision. Should I give a certain medication or not? If I prescribe the medication and it is effective, I have done well. But if I prescribe the drug and that drug is not effective, I have made an error, a type 1 error. On the other hand, if I decide not to prescribe the drug and that drug would not have had any effect, I have made the right decision. But if I did not prescribe the medication, and it would have had a positive effect. I made another type of decision error. In a research study in which we propose a hypothesis, there are also potential errors. If, for example, we decide to reject the null hypothesis and retain the alternate when we should not have we have made a type 1 error. And if we decide not to reject the null hypothesis when, in fact, we should have, we have made a type 2 error. In research of this nature, alpha and beta are the probabilities that we have defined as the acceptable limits of committing type 1 and type 2 errors. We want alpha, as well as beta, to be small probabilities. For example, no more than 5 or 10 percent. But we also recognize that they can never be set at a probability of zero, because if they were, we could never reach that probability. And consequently, we could never reach a conclusion. More about that later. We must also recognize that alpha and beta are inversely related. That is, in trying to decrease the probability of making one, we increase the probability of the other. What does this all mean? Alpha has to do with statistical significance, with our level of confidence. Generally, Alpha is set to 0.05 or 0.01. That is, we can have a reasonable 95% or 99% confidence in stating that there is a difference, that there is a relationship. Beta has to do with power, with the sensitivity of research. Generally, power 1 minus beta is set at 0.80 or 0.90. That is, we can be reasonably sure of detecting a truth that is at least as great as the effect size gamma that we have determined. And that brings us to the third factor, effect size. Gamma has to do with meaningfulness. It is the minimum difference or the minimum relationship that will be of importance, of practical value to us. For example, a minimum difference 
can be defined in terms of a proportion of sigma. For example, a gamma value defined as 0.3 sigma indicates that we have defined as important any difference between means greater than about a third of a standard deviation. If we are talking about relationships, the minimum relationship that we consider important can be defined in terms of variance explained. A gamma defined as r equals 0.30, for example, represents an r squared equal to 0.09, which means that any r value that represents more than 9% of the variance we will consider as important. How then do we determine the minimum effect size? Simply by deciding what is the minimum difference or the minimum relationship that will be important to us. And we make that decision based on theory, prior research, experience, and logic. There are, of course, statistical packages that can help us perform this analysis. For a question of difference, for example, the minimum sample size in required in a two-tailed test with an infinite or unknown population and a power of 0.80 would be as shown in this table. Differences of 0.5 standard deviation or greater would probably be rather obvious before conducting a study. On the other side of the continuum, differences of 0.1 standard deviation or less may not represent a difference of practical importance. In between, we encounter those findings that are neither obvious nor trivial, but rather of practical importance. Cohen, for example, defines such approximate effect sizes as large, medium, and small. Similarly, for a question of relationship, the minimum required sample size would be as shown in this table. For a given population then, the smaller alpha, the smaller beta, and the greater the power, 1 minus beta, and the smaller gamma, the effect size that we consider important, the larger must be in the minimum required sample size. In summary, the required sample size is not a magic number such as a set number for all studies or a proportion of the population. Rather, it is a specific number determined through power analysis where we seek to balance alpha and beta while taking gamma into account. Myth number five. If something is statistically significant, it is important. Stanley Milgram proposed the theory of six degrees of separation, which indicates that every person in the world is not more than six relationships removed from any other person. With the advent of social networks, it is estimated that now there are only four degrees of separation. Conclusion? Everything is interconnected. Everything is related. At the same time, it is logical to recognize that no two things are identical in all their characteristics. It is impossible, for example, for two entities to have the same form and function and occupy the same place at the same time. Conclusion? Every entity is somewhat different from every other entity. 
In other words, no two things are completely alike in the real world. Therefore, everything that exists is in some way related to, but different from, every other entity. Consequently, if we increase sample size toward infinity, two variables will always give evidence of a relationship that is statistically significant. And the difference between two categories of a variable will always be statistically significant. Why then do we conduct research if everything is related and if everything has a difference? We must first remember that statistical significance has to do with confidence, with the fact that we want to be quite certain that results are trustworthy. However, not every difference, nor every relationship is of practical importance. In evaluating an experimental teaching strategy with a large sample, for example, we might be able to identify a 0.1% performance difference as statistically significant. But this is not likely to be a meaningful difference in terms of educational value or the cost of the program. It is true that the p-value, that is the probability of type 1 error and the effect size gamma, have a certain relationship. Statistical significance is necessary but insufficient to enable us to speak of importance. In other words, it is necessary to first establish that something is trustworthy in order to talk about its importance. But the mere fact that something is trustworthy, p less than 0.05, for example, does not necessarily imply that it is of practical importance. The trustworthiness of a result and the importance of that result are simply two different things. With large samples, most relationships or differences examined are likely to be statistically significant. But without considering effect size, one cannot state that something is important. Given that statistical significance does not equal importance, we must be careful not to allow the fascination of accurately measuring minutia to distract us from that which is truly important. Myth number six. If there is no statistical significance, I can conclude that there is no difference or no relationship. If I do not find a statistically significant difference, can I declare that there is no difference? And if I did not find a statistically significant relationship, can I declare that there is no relationship? As we have mentioned, statistical significance gives us confidence that the results are trustworthy. Therefore, when statistical significance is not attained, we do not have confidence in the fidelity of the results. When a statistical process does not return a probability of type 1 error less than the error limit that we have defined, that is, p less than alpha, what can we conclude? Nothing. No conclusion can be made regarding a matter if the findings on which that conclusion would be based are not trustworthy. What can we say then? The only thing 
we can state is that the results are inconclusive. This means that we know nothing more now than before we started the research. What is the reason for this sad situation? If we properly conducted the power analysis to determine the minimum number required for the sample, and if we obtained that sample size, the statistical processes will give us a good probability, for example, a power of at least 90% that the relationships or differences larger than gamma, the minimum effect size that will be of practical importance, have been detected. The inconclusive results situations are common because the sample was too small, less than the minimum that a power analysis would have indicated. The solution for future research. Be sure to obtain the minimum sample size indicated by a power analysis. Myth 7. If I find a significant difference between A and B, and A is greater than B, I can say that A is greater than B overall. For example, when I find in a study a statistically significant difference between the linguistic ability of boys and girls, favoring girls, will I be able to declare that girls in general have a greater linguistic ability than boys? When I obtain a sample, that sample must be representative of the given population. The best way to ensure that it is representative in its various aspects is by having a sufficient number in the sample, as we have discussed, and by using a random process to derive that sample from the population. We should point out, however, that what we refer to as the population is really the sampling frame. All preschool children in a certain town, for example, from which we derive the sample. By having a representative sample, I can then confidently generalize my conclusions to that sampling frame. The problem, however, is that many times I would like to generalize to the total population, that is, to all preschool children that exist. But that is something I cannot do, simply because I do not know if the preschool children in that certain town are representative of all preschool children worldwide. And there is probably no way of knowing. If I endeavor to generalize to a total population of which my sample is potentially not representative, I have made an overgeneralization error. What then can I say? If the sample was representative, I can only state that A is greater than B in the population that is the sampling frame of my study. What can I not say? That A is greater than B for all the A and B in general. By the way, what if I could not obtain a random sample? Then the sample is not representative of anything, and I cannot generalize. I can only comment on the characteristics of that group of individuals who participated in the study. But that does not make much sense because it does not allow me to extend the findings at all. And a research study should result to at least some degree in generalizable knowledge. 
Myth number eight. If I discover a relationship between X and Y, can I say that X has an effect on Y? If I find that 99% of heroin addicts drank milk as children, can I conclude that drinking milk leads to addiction? If I find that there is a strong relationship between years of being married and the probability of death, can I conclude that marriage is the cause of death? Obviously, those conclusions seem outlandish, but only because we know better. But what happens when we do not know? A correlation is necessary but insufficient to establish causation. In other words, all causality must be based on an underlying correlation. But we cannot conclude causality simply because we have found a correlation. Why is this the case? First, because often we do not know the direction of the relationship. Imagine that for the first time we come across a windmill. Looking closely, we realize that the speed of rotation of the windmill and the speed of the wind correlates. A potential conclusion based on the data could be that windmills are huge fans that produce wind. Or, to switch the illustration, imagine that we come upon a car that has hit a tree. The vehicle has a blown tire. Did the crash produce the blowout, or could it be that the blowout resulted in the wreck? The key point is that arriving after the fact, either option could be viable. Another consideration is the possible influence of a third variable. In a study, for example, we find that as ice cream sales rise and fall over the course of the year, the death rate due to drowning also similarly rises and falls. We might be tempted to conclude that ice cream consumption precipitates drowning. In reality, however, both increase and decrease because we are entering and leaving the summer, where the change in environmental temperature influences both the consumption of ice cream as well as the probability that people are swimming and therefore the possibility of drowning. Given these circumstances, what can we say when we find a correlation? We can state that X is related to Y, or simply that there is a correlation between X and Y, or that X is associated with Y. What we cannot declare is that one of the variables precipitates, leads to, or produces changes in the other variable, nor can we speak of impact, of effect, or of influence, nor regarding result, outcome, or consequence. Now, the final myth that we will consider, myth number nine. Research proves, research has confirmed. If we want certainty, that is, total confidence, we must set alpha equal to zero. And if we set alpha at zero, we will always find that P will be greater than alpha, indicating that there is no statistical significance. Therefore, as we have seen, the only thing we can say is that the results are inconclusive. If we set alpha to some other value, such as 0.05, then 
there is a 5% chance that our conclusions could be incorrect, even when we achieve statistical significance. As a result, in research, nothing is ever proved. Scientifically, we live in a world of probabilities and possibilities, not certainties. Research findings may indeed lend support to a premise or research hypothesis, but a theory is never fully supported. In fact, a successful theory is merely one that has been tested and has escaped being discarded for now. To put it another way, the results of the research probe, but do not prove a theory. There is never a final word in research, only the latest word, which we hope points in the right direction. Just by tracing the winding history of science, we realize that research has no absolute answers. With so many myths in research that can entrap us, what can we do? The fundamental problem often lies in our innate desire to be something beyond who we really are. To say something more comprehensive and authoritative than what we can legitimately say. Our circle of knowledge is surrounded by the vast universe of our ignorance, by all that we do not know. The problem is that for most of that universe, we do not know that we do not know. In fact, the only things that we realize that we do not know are the points in that universe that touch the perimeter of our circle of knowledge. When the circle is small, the perimeter is also small. And we are tempted to think that although there are still a few things that we do not know, we already know almost everything. However, as we learn new things, including through research, the circle of our knowledge grows. But the perimeter is also expanding. And when that happens, we start to come into contact with more and more of that which we still do not know. So, research invariably raises more questions than it answers. And that is why the more we learn, the more we realize how much we do not know. And the more humble and more teachable we are to become.